I brought something up here with me just in case I need it. It's uh, Mountain Dew. Chuck said, uh, this is my spiritual warfare elixir. And so uh, I brought it up here uh, with me tonight. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, welcome back to Sunday nights. And uh, glad to have you out and such a great crowd. But we're not only, this isn't the only crowd that we have tonight. Uh, we're being watched by people on live stream, all our live stream. We normally don't live stream Sunday evenings, but because of the nature of the series that I'm about to begin with you, we got so many requests. I was getting, when I was in New Hampshire, I was telling Chuck, uh, I had people sending me emails. People I don't even know were, were sending me messages saying, you guys are going to live stream this. You are going to live stream this. And so, indeed, we're live streaming this series uh, for the foreseeable uh, future. But So that means we have people joining us from around the country. Would you take a moment and welcome them uh, to our worship time tonight? And then I want to invite you to take uh, your copy of God's Word and open up to Ephesians uh, chapter 6. As I said, uh, and ha we have been saying for some time, um, that I wanted to do a series with you on spiritual warfare. Now, I've been here for 17 and a half years, and so I went back, and I can check and see what I've preached and that, those sorts of things. I, I like to know that so I don't do uh, uh, overlap uh, uh, too much. But there are some things that we ought to overlap. And one of those things is spiritual warfare. And that's because it never goes away. It never goes away. And uh, I think it was in 2010 that I last preached on the subject of spiritual warfare. And then uh, earlier in my ministry here, I did a series on spiritual warfare. But while we were away in July, uh, Alice and I uh, talked and I began praying and, and thinking about uh, this time. And I had this strong sense from the Lord that it was time for me to talk to you again about uh, spiritual warfare, in part because so many people that I have uh, been in touch with in the last uh, couple of months, just the intensity of what they're going through is just unbelievable. And uh, now we're always in war, right? We're always a believer. We're always in spiritual war. But the intensity of it uh, uh, changes from time to time. And uh, I got to thinking about why is that? Why is the intensity different sometimes? You know, they're, they're, you're, the war's always going on, but sometimes you just feel like the, the attack is, is just picked you out of a lineup and said, I'm the devil and I'm going to beat the life out of you. And all of us have been there. But why is it sometimes the intensity level is so much different? Well, we were talking in our men's group tonight, and by the way, we had a great, ended up having a great discussion about uh, spiritual warfare and kind of a Q&A and some things over the course of this series that I will talk about and address anyway. But why is it? And here's the thing. We tend to think that the opposite of God is the devil, right? God and the devil. But listen to this. God doesn't have an opposite. There's nobody comparable to God. For example, God is, we say He's omnipresent. That means God can be everywhere and all places and is. The devil can't. So He's not opposite. The devil is not uh, the, evil, the evil counterpart to God. He is the arch enemy of God, but he has, He's nothing comparable to God. He, listen, He got cast out of heaven because He thought He was. You know, the Bible says he was the most beautiful of all the creations of God, and it went to his head. He said, surely something as pretty as this could probably run his own kingdom. And God said, I'm going to show you that you are not close to what you think you are. And he was cast out along with a third of the angels of heaven that became what we know as the demonic host. And we don't know how many of that it is, but it's a lot. Because we know that there's a lot of angels. You, how do we know that? Well, Jesus said, don't you know that if I wanted to, I could call down a legion of uh, angels just like that to deliver me? And so we don't know what a third of the demonic host is, but it's enough to wreak havoc in this world. And it's enough to, to partner with the devil himself and, uh, and control this domain that we call this physical world. He's, he's called that, you know, the prince of power of the heirs we'll see in the Scripture. And so, but, so why is it that uh, sometimes the intensity is greater in your life than it is? Uh, I believe it is because the devil can't be everywhere, and sometimes he concentrates some of his attention in an area. I don't have time to talk about that tonight, but sometimes I believe that's geographical. 
uh, and specific to a, a demographic. And, and it, sometimes it can be to a congregation or congregations or a city or community. And again, I may talk about that through the, 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 this, um, this study and series. Uh, I've had some experience with that. It's the only reason I would say that. But the point is, sometimes the intensity is greater because the, the, the devil s- sends his host in and says, uh, I want to I concentrate some of the battle right here in this place. And you may be a part of that place, or it may be something God is trying to do or work in you, and the devil says, I'm going to try to prevent that from happening. See, Spurgeon, see, Spurgeon, you know who he was. He said this, he said, the devil never kicks a dead horse. Does that make sense? Man, if there's nothing happening in your life for God, you're probably not going to experience a lot of of assault or attack. You say, well, I think that's the approach I'm going to take. It's not worth it. You know, it's better to be, uh, uh, it's better to be armed and fighting in the battle of God than to be disconnected from the God because you're going to need your general at some point in time. And so uh, as I began to look and think and pray over July and, and uh, I thought, well, um, we need to, we need, it's time to, to talk about spiritual warfare again. So many people. And I, I, what I want us to do, we're going to, primarily we're going to look at Ephesians 6 over the next uh, a number of weeks, uh, but we may not stay there. There's so much. The Bible has a lot to say about uh, our uh, enemy. And so we'll look there at that as our primary text. I brought with me a book uh, written by a military strategist um, who, uh, um, wrote this book in 500 B.C. His name was Sun Tzu. He was a Chinese military strategist. And by the way, if you go buy this book, I got mine in Oxford in England, but if you go buy this book, you will find it in the business section or military history. And this book, The Art of War, I read many years ago, but this book has been studied by all the great military generals of history. And not only that, it has been taught and studied in our military academies and in various other places because of the tactics that he suggests as it relates to warfare. And a lot of it's very simple. Now, this particular copy is, has a lot of periphery stuff about Sun Tzu and about Mao Zedong and uh, some others uh, who relied upon this material. But it's a, it's a manual on warfare. And listen when he begins. This is his opening statement. War is a matter of vital importance to the state. The province of life or death, the road to survival or ruin, It is mandatory that it be thoroughly studied. Now, if that would be true of cultures, how much more so is it true of the greatest of all battles and wars that's being waged, and that is the battle in the heavenlies and the battle for your soul? If you don't know Christ, you need to know the enemy wants to take your soul to hell. Remember what Jesus said? He said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body in this world, but he said, be afraid of those who can destroy in hell. That's what the enemy wants to do. In fact, the Bible says he's come for the purpose to steal. He wants to rob you, to kill, and to destroy. That's his, that's his plan. And he uses what we call a three-category uh, approach, the world, the flesh, and the devil of which all relate to him by God's permission. God has allowed him to be the prince of this fallen world, but that's that's the best he's got. That's all he's got. And you know, we know that God has allowed him a certain amount of privilege, right? Because you remember when Jesus was tempted, do you remember what happened? The devil took him up onto the, the high place and he said, look out over the kingdoms of the world. And we don't know, but somehow uh, uh, he made known to Christ all the kingdoms of the world. He, as many scholars believe, uh, he created a, a, almost a demonic vision that displayed the kingdoms of the world and said to Jesus, I can give all of these to you if you'll just simply bow down and follow me. He knew he had that kind of authority, and he could give it to Jesus. You say, well, that seems kind of, because Jesus was God, but Jesus willingly made himself a, a fleshly human. 
He was all God and he was all man. And so his flesh could be tempted, and the Bible says it was. He was tempted in all manner, like as you and I, yet without sin. So the devil says to him, see all this stuff, it's mine, I can give it to you. If you want it, or if you will follow me, it's yours. Thank God, amen, that Jesus didn't buy on that one. You know what, we'll talk about this later in the series. You know what he did, he quoted the word of God to him. As we look at this armor in the weeks to come, I want to tell you something. You, you need to know, uh, one of our men in men's group tonight says, but how do we apply the armor? That's a good question. How do we use the armor? And we're going to talk about that. But you know, in all of the armor, let me tell you right up front, there's only one offensive piece of armor. All the rest are protective. You know what the, uh, the offensive piece is? The sword of the Spirit or the Word of God. And Jesus shows us, Jesus uses that, doesn't he, in the, in the wilderness when the devil uh, tempts him. And so we need to understand the enemy. Some, someone has said, but, but why should we worry so much about the enemy? Shouldn't we just focus on Jesus? Well, there's a fine line for sure, but if you don't know who the enemy is, you're going to get clobbered. And if you don't understand, the reason the Scripture has so much to say about the enemy is so that we are not deceived and so that we don't, uh, we don't get beat up by his tactics. Now, wouldn't it be great if you could get out of the battle? For me, my choice would be, I just want to be out of the battle and concentrate on something else. But you can't. This is not a battle. Look, I told our guys tonight, I want you to know something about this battle. It's being waged in the heavenlies. If we could pull back the curtain and see what was actually going on right now, it would probably scare us to death to see this battle that's being waged and fought. If you're lost, as I said, it's a battle for your eternal soul. But if you're saved, it is a battle to ruin you. And you say, well, why would he try to ruin me now if I'm saved? Because he hates God. And some of it is just pure spite. I'm going to show God I can take those that he's redeemed and I can uh, uh, take them down. And so we need to understand the battle. We need to understand uh, the warfare. And that's what I want us to do. There was a study conducted by Barner Research of various denominational groups uh, regarding the notion that Satan or the devil is a real being who can influence people's life and they discovered this, for most Americans, religious and Christian Americans, they regard the idea of the devil as a real person as hogwash. Listen to these statistics. One quarter, 27% strongly believe that Satan is real, while the majority argue that he is just a symbol of evil. Wow. And... Uh, and the study says, and this was surprising, the group that most likely accepts the reality of Satan's existence are Mormons. You would have said Baptists, wouldn't you? Catholics, Episcopalians, and Methodists are the least likely. That's not a shot at those. It's just the facts of the research. They're le least likely just a fifth of them uh, in the study by Barna, which is considered the premier uh, polling of Christian organizations, just one-fifth. And listen to this, only 57% of those who attend Baptist churches strongly believe that the devil is real and not symbolic. Only 50, no wonder there's so many Christian casualties. No wonder so many are getting beat up. We don't even believe that there's a real enemy we are fighting. And as I told our men's group tonight, here's what we do sometimes to those who, who refuse to accept a real, now by the way, the statistics are, Totally different when you ask, uh, who believes in heaven? Man, it's 90%. Because we want that side of it. But there's this weird thing for many people that they do, and that is stuff that they don't want, they simply deny by acting like it doesn't exist. You know, it's the old thing, if, if I can't see you, then you're not there. And that's sort of what many have done with the devil. Well, I just, he's just, the, the, the devil isn't real. It's a symbol of evil. That's what most Americans in some kind of religious context say. And almost as many Baptists. Wow. No wonder we're getting the life beat out of us. Now, 
If that be the case, we need to make sure we understand who our enemy is, you know, that he is real and he's there. It's like the story of the boxer who was in the boxing ring against a champion fighter, and the champion was just beating the, the stew out of this guy. And every time this guy'd go to his corner at the end of each round, his trainer would say to him, Keep it up, you're doing great. The champion's not hurting you, he's not even touching you, keep it up. And finally, after hearing this for several rounds, as the boxer stumbled back to his corner and sat down, his trainer said that he was doing great. You're doing great. He's not touching me. And the boxer says, I want to tell you something. If I'm doing great and he's not touching me, please keep your eye on the referee because somebody in that ring's killing me. <laughs> well, there are people that are getting beat up and and in large part because they aren't certain that the battle is real and that the enemy is real and that they're in a real fight. And so that's what this series is about. You know the subtitle is Spiritual Warfare, Are You Prepared for the Battle? Not Can You Get Out of the Battle. By the way, one of our guys tonight in our, our men's group said, I have a question for you, Pastor. He said, so if God knows we're going to be in a battle, should we even pray for God to deliver us. Ah, you'll have to hang on to about the eighth message before I answer that question. But, but we do need to understand who the enemy is and where the battle's being fought. If you're physically able to do so, stand with me as we read verses 10 to uh, uh, 13 here in the passage on Ephesians 6. Finally, this is the end of the book, the end of his letter to these Christ, uh, Christians at Ephesus. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Not yours, but His. We'll come back to that later in the series. Put on the whole armor of God. That is a command, by the way. It's in the imperative. It's not an option. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Look this way for a second. Do you understand when he says we don't wrestle? Some of the things that we wrestle with in the flesh really have their source in hell. That's what he's saying. We don't just wrestle with flesh and blood. That's what we always tend to think. Man, something's happening in my life, you know, and, it, and it, we point to some physical situation or circumstances. And many times it was sourced in hell, and we miss that. And that's what he's saying here. We're, this is a cosmic battle. Verse 13, therefore, because that is true, take up the whole armor of God. There it is again. That you, what? You may be able to withstand in the evil day. That means when it's really intense, when you think, I've got to have help, I need armor in that evil day. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to us tonight as we study this. Protect our hearts and guard our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this is a spiritual call to arms, you might say. A, a call to be armed and ready. Not, listen, not in case war breaks out. This isn't a call to arms because you may end up in a battle. This is a call to arms because you're already in a battle. There was a man after a Desert Storm, a soldier, you know, when Desert Storm, that was in the early 90s, hard to believe, isn't it? Desert Storm. Some of you, we have some in this church who, who fought in Desert Storm. And uh, we all remember that, that first Gulf War, we call it. And I remember reading shortly after, after, it, after the war began, there were a number of soldiers that went AWOL. And um, I read about one particular one in a national news um, a paper. Uh, this was after the war had progressed, and they caught up with this guy. He had gone to Canada, and, uh, but they caught him. He wanted to come back home. I can understand that. And he, uh, they called him. And so uh, he went to court marshals. And when they asked him why he had gone AWOL, this was his answer. I did not know when I enlisted in the army that I might have to go fight. 
That was his defense. Now, we laugh at that because we say, are you kidding? I did not know if I enlisted in the army. Armies exist because there are wars, right? Now, Paul says that God has an armor because there are wars, except these are spiritual wars, and so this is a spiritual kind of armor that God calls us to put on. And so the Bible is a spiritual warfare handbook. Now, these generals read The Art of War, Sun Tzu, and I enjoyed it. But the fact is, in the spiritual battle, this is the book you got to read. Because it, and it's designed, this whole, this probably, chapter 6 of Ephesians is probably the greatest passage in all of Scripture about spiritual war. Now, there's a lot of discussion about it. Peter talks about it. We'll look at that down the road as well. But today, I want to use this spiritual handbook for war uh, to help us get a better understanding of our adversary. And there are three things that I want to give you tonight about your adversary, the devil. Here's the first one. I want you to notice how he operates. That is, what is his conduct? You, we see it in verse 11. Look there. Keep your Bible open so you can reference back. Boy, it says, put on the whole armor of God. Here's why. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. If we're going to have daily victory over the enemy, it is important to be familiar with his tactics. The Bible calls them schemes. It's a Greek word, methodia. We get our English word method from it. And it means cunning or craftiness, or in this case, deceitful methods. And so Paul says to us, he says, look, you got to understand how he operates. He, he is scheming. The devil has schemes. He has cunning, cleverly crafted techniques to attack you with. In fact, that's why we miss some of them, because he's very crafty. And, you know, again, I've said this to you before, but I remind you, if the devil were to come up to you and say, hey, I'm the devil, and I'm about to try to beat you up, you'd say, hey, I'm, I'm on my knees, I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm on and on and on, which is why he doesn't approach you that way. The Bible says he masquerades as an angel of light. Do you know he often masquerades through religious things to try to throw us off? to try to, to, to make us vulnerable to his, his plan to ruin us or to destroy us. And the idea here is that Satan, he, he's not carrying open warfare. Satan is more of a guerrilla warfare strategist. You know, one of the things, and you, if you've read any war history, you read, uh, of course, and we have men and, uh, and women that have ser that served in the military in the Vietnam War. And you know one of the most difficult parts of that war for us was the guerrilla warfare. Because we were more equipped to deal with a full army, but in the, in the jungles of South Vietnam, uh, uh, South, North and South Vietnam, uh, we just didn't have quite the expertise that we were if you just put us in a conventional battle. And the tactics that were used were unconventional military tactics. Well, the devil operates kind of like that, um, subversively, not openly. We're just too smart. You want an open fight? We can recognize the open fight. You might beat us up, but we can recognize open battle. But he says, no, no, I'm going to be very subversive in my approach. And that's what the idea is here, that he's scheming behind the scenes. He's looking, and by the way, it becomes personal. He's looking for vulnerabilities in your life. I'm going to find out the way that I can attack you and the way that I can take you down. He doesn't meet us face to face. He advances covertly. He makes his approach in darkness and he uses cunning rather than power. Uh, he seeks rather to deceive and betray us than, rather than to defeat us by mere force. And that's why it's necessary to be constantly armed against his assault, against his attack. A man who has to contend with a visible enemy may feel safe but if he only prepares to meet him in the open field of battle. But it's far different 
if the enemy is invisible. And that's how the devil approaches us. That's the foe that we're facing, and that's what we have to contend with. He approaches us not in repulsive forms. Remember, he's an angel of light. Isn't that what the Bible, he masquerades, he's not an angel of light. He masquerades as an angel of light. But he was the most beautiful of all the creations of God. He doesn't, he doesn't approach us in repulsive forms, but he comes to, to recommend sometimes some plausible error and we, causes us to believe it and it lays us uh, uh, before some temptation that we swallow and we believe. Or he gives us or he presents something that just seems normal and logical and doesn't seem damning to us, and he lays that before us to try to throw us off course. He presents the world as an, uh, in it, all of its allure, and he invites us to pleasures that seem to be harmless but lead us into ruin and indulgence and destruction. For years, my dad uh, traveled... Um, a couple of times a year to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where he would teach in the war college, the Army War College. And uh, I know he had top secret clearance, and he took that seriously. I know he taught high-ranking officers much higher than he was. He was a sergeant major uh, when he retired. But uh, I only know vaguely what he taught them. But I do know that the courses he taught were designed to help them understand tactics and chemical weaponry that might be used against us. How we would, how we would defend ourselves, how we would prepare ourselves against those sorts of things. And that he taught years before it became a reality that now is an understood thing, uh, unfortunately, in our, our, our warfare. And I remember him watching I, I mean, I remember watching him study, and he had these manuals that he had to study as he prepared to go off to the war college to teach these courses, and I remember watching him studying. He couldn't tell me much about it, and I would be curious, and I was a teenager at that stage, and I would try to get him to spill the beans, you know, and he just wouldn't, but I do remember how he studied that material because it was so important, because he was going to pass it on to high-ranking officers who were going to pass it on, in essence, to troops and others that they would train. He took it seriously. Well, likewise, the Bible's a, 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 a spiritual war college course for us to study and to understand these tactics, these schemes of the enemy. So let me give you some of the schemes that the devil used. This is not an all-inclusive list. But let me give you some, uh, some strategies that he employs, some schemes that he uses. And when I, when I call these out, you're going to say, yep. In fact, you don't have to, you don't have to verbally raise, uh, say yes or raise your hand or anything, but I'm going to call out some things right now, and some of you are being attacked by the enemy with these things. And they're not from God. They're not from God. Like this one, discouragement. A subtle but destructive weapon because it causes us to give up or it causes us to give in or it causes us to give out. Discouragement. Some of you here are discouraged. I told you that my task when I went to New Hampshire with these, all these New England pastors, they said, please bring a word of encouragement. You know why it's tough? And because the devil, one of the ways he attacks a servant of God, not just up there. I said, hey, look, it's not just needed up here. It's needed everywhere. When people are serving God, the enemy tries to discourage them and um, tries to get them to give up. I, I, I sat down with several pastors and their wives while I was there who said, uh, thank you for the word that you shared. Uh, we were at the point of giving up and, and leaving. And um, they're just discouraged. But we get discouraged too, and we don't often understand that the devil, look, is the author, the champion of discouragement. Another scheme that he uses is temptation, a strategy to ruin you by distracting you from serving God and to put a barrier up in your fellowship with God. You see, if he can get you to yield to temptation, what he does is he creates this little barrier. He doesn't destroy your relationship with God. If you yield to temptation, you don't lose your relationship with God. What you lose is fellowship with God. It's a big difference. 
And he doesn't want you having fellowship with God. He hates God. And if he can break your fellowship with God, then he in the heavenlies can say, see, there's another one. They don't love you like you love them. So he brings temptation into your life. He wants to ruin he wants to ruin you by distracting you from following and serving God. Here's a third scheme that I've observed over the years that he uses, and that is deception. Deception, which is a scheme to mislead your mind, just like he did in the garden. Remember what he did with Adam and Eve in the garden? He deceived. He told a half-truth, which, by the way, is a whole lie with God. And he says, has God really told you you can't eat from that tree? He created doubt. He deceived them into believing that God was holding out on them. Now, I want to tell you something. In the battle, often the enemy of your soul, the devil, will try to make you think that God is holding out on you, that you deserve better, and God knows that, but he doesn't want you uh, to have victory because he is holding out on you. He can't be trusted. That's what the devil loves to do, deceive our minds about what's right, what's wrong. Here's a fourth scheme that I've observed over the years, and that is condemnation. It's a tactic that renders you useless. Use your, he'll use your failures to destroy your future. But you know what the Bible says? Now listen to this. When the devil starts bringing condemnation into your life, let me tell you what the Scripture says. There is now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That cross was about condemnation. Yours, not his. He was condemned for our sake, but it was our condemnation that put him on that cross. What the devil tries to say, you really think God could forgive you for what you've done? You really think that God, uh, God uh, uh, can have a relationship with you after you failed the way you failed? Condemnation, condemnation. You know, the Scripture says this, we have confidence before God if our hearts do not condemn us. You know what that means? So we can boldly approach the throne of grace, the Scripture says, if we have confidence. And that confidence is because we're no longer condemned in Christ. It didn't say we're, no, we're, we're, not, we're, we're now perfect. We are perfected in the ultimate sense uh, before God. We are righteous before God, but we're not perfect in this fleshly body. We fail and fail and fail and fail. And so the devil, what he does is he capitalizes on the failure and says, see, you really think you're redeemed? That's why the song says... <laughs> Let the redeemed of the Lord say, so. So? No, that's not what it meant. Right? It means I'm redeemed. Say it. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. See? And by the way, the devil hates that. And so he brings condemnation. You know, in my life on several occasions when the devil has brought condemnation to my heart and said, Ray, you really think, you really think you're fit to be a servant of God. You know what I learned a long time ago? When he starts messing with my head, this is what I say to him. I'm qualified because of what Jesus did. I am redeemed, and you leave me alone in Jesus' name. I'm redeemed. See? Leave me alone in Jesus' name. You leave me alone. You quit messing with me. Now listen, he wants to bring condemnation. There are so many people that could be serving God so powerfully, but they can't get past of their failures. The devil says, I want to ruin you and destroy you with that. Here's another scheme, intimidation. To scare you, he'll scare you. He'll try to scare you. He'll, he'll try to bully you. Now, let me tell you one of the ways he does that. He says, yeah, you start serving God, and he's going to do something to you. We jokingly say around here on our staff, when you come on staff here, get ready, you're going to have surgery. Don't we, Chuck? We laugh about it, but it's amazing how many folks have. I'm, I, and I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek. But we sometimes believe that sort of stuff, don't we? Well, gosh, if I really sell out to God, what will the devil take away from me? What will the devil do to me? Now, he won't do anything that is not allowable by God. And when God allows anything, remember, he's bigger than your circumstances. When God allows anything, it is because God has something better. For your life. But the devil wants to scare you. He is a bully. 
and he wants to cause you to live in fear and fear of consequences or feel threatened by him. That's why the scripture says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let me give you another one because I want to move on and kind of wrap this thing up for tonight. But here, here is, here's another scheme. Depreciation. Now here's what I mean by that. I just needed an, a word that went with the others. Depreciation. He'll tell you you're a loser. <laughs> okay? Just to preserve my outline. Okay? I just want you to know. Um, uh, but he will tell you you're a loser. He'll depreciate you. That's what I mean. He'll put you down. This isn't condemnation. This is just, you, you just, you won't amount to anything. I want to tell you something. The devil try to tell you that you're a nothing. Because he doesn't want you to be a something for God. I look back and I thank God Almighty. I think I came from obscurity. There was nothing about our family that should cause us to have any kind of advantage. But I look back and I, like David, can say the boundary lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. He took a nothing and he did a something. <clears throat> he gave me a beautiful relationship with him. He saved me when I was a kid. He gave me a beautiful wife who felt called into ministry. He gave me a beautiful daughter and a son-in-law that's okay. <laughs> no. He gave me a beautiful family. And he gave me a beautiful congregation. And I look at that and I say, wow. The devil says, you're a nothing. You'll never amount to anything. And God says, I take nothings. I specialize in nothings. And I do somethings with them. You know what? Uh, the devil thought he won on the cross, didn't he? There was some celebrating in hell for just a short time. <laughs> and then Christ arose. And Paul writes in Corinthians and says, had the devil known about God's plan to raise the son and pay the debt of sin, they would have never, the world would have never, he wouldn't have allowed the world to crucify the son of God. That's why God says, you got a covert plan, so do I. And see, he didn't know. But God knew his plan. But he didn't know God's plan. He was a part. He was, a, he was complicit in the very plan of God. Don't you know that has to stew him? It shows again who's in charge. And who's most powerful? And you know what God does so often? He takes a nothing and does a something with it. That's why Paul would write and say that God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So when the, when the devil whispers to you and tries to, to put you down and says, you're a nothing, you say, I'm a nothing, but Jesus is a something. And he lives in me. And because he lives in me, he takes the foolish and does something with it for his glory. <clears throat> Never drop your guard when it comes to his schemes. Now, I'm going to do something here. I'm going, to, I'm going to do something that just needs to be done. There's too much left for me to say to you tonight. And so I'm going to stop right here. You know, that's a great thing after you've pastored all these years. You never quit preaching. You just unhitch. And so I'm going to unhitch. There's two more things. I just gave you one tonight, his conduct. We've still got a couple other things that I want you to see about the enemy. But now, here's what I want to say to you. Because you know a little bit about the enemy, don't walk out and say, so where's the victory? The victory's already happened. The victory has already happened. So when you walk out of here tonight, if you say, I need more help than that, I'm, it's coming, <laughs> okay? And we're going to prepare you for the battle. But tonight, just walk out in, with this. I belong to him. The enemy has been defeated. And right now, if that's all I've got, that's enough. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is the prince and power of the air out there. 
And by the way, people sometimes say, well, do I need a, do I need a family? We had a couple of families join us this morning and our second service. They say, do, do I need a family? Do I, do I really need a family to belong to? The answer is yes, because you see, we don't send one-man armies to battle, do we? The reason that you need a team of folks is because they're going to be with you in the battle. It may not always be their battle, but they're there to love you and support you and care for you. That's why, that's one of the reasons among many that God pulled together his people together in assembly. There's something, you see, when you realize that there's a whole team of us, and then you multiply it across the globe. Look at all of those who are followers of Christ. Guess what? And you hear their stories and see their battles and see their victories. And sometimes when they've been beat up. And you know what God says? He says, you be a help to them now. And they'll be a help to you. But pity the believer that doesn't have a family to go into battle with. Tonight, if you don't have a family, maybe this is the family for you. We're not perfect, and we know there's a war, and we're committed to the battle together. And I want to invite you to come and connect with us tonight if you're looking for a family. Brother Tim, would you come this way? You may be here and say, you know what? You talked about earlier this cosmic spiritual battle, if we could just see it, you talked about the devil wanting to destroy my soul. If you don't know Christ, that's true. That's not hyperbole. That's not just, hey, this is, and I'm not trying to spook you. It's, that's just reality. And so if you're here tonight and you're not sure that if you died, that you would be in the kingdom of God, you need to settle that before you leave here. Don't walk out into his domain without the victor in your heart. I want to lead us in prayer. I'm going to ask you to stand. And after that, Brother Tim's going to lead us uh, in our time of invitation. I'll be here to receive you. Staff members will be here to receive you. And if there's a decision that I mentioned or others that you need to make tonight, you slip out and come on. Father, thank you for the victory that is ours. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Help us, Father, as we analyze our adversary. Help us, Father, to understand not just who he is, but who you are. And we thank you for that. Father, there are some in this place that are going through struggles and battles right now, and they need to know your presence is with them. Would you grant that, I pray. Help them to walk out of this place knowing that you have won the victory, even if they don't understand all the war, or even how to be completely protected by the armor. Help them to walk out knowing, knowing that the enemy has been defeated and that his day is coming. If not now, it's coming, Father. Help them to know that and walk in victory. And Lord, would you speak now as we wait before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Words are on the screen as Brother Tim leads us. You slip out. Come on right now. <laughs>